Catholic education at this moment, right, we have inherited a great tradition. Uh, we're not just sitting down with textbooks out of nowhere trying to teach isolated facts, right? We have a coherent vision of the purpose of human life, of the purpose of human history, of the goodness of life, the beauty of life that we want to share with our students, right? We are continuing on this great story of the church, despite all the difficulties and hardships, right? This is our mission, to say that we want to pass on this legacy of education that we have received of truth, of goodness, of beauty uh, that we have received. And, and this is an image here, I think, which just captures that very well. This is the, the Word, right? The eternal Word of God by whom everything has been created. Everything in the universe is an expression of the Word of God. And human reason um, is an expression of the Word of God. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And so we can grasp this truth that God has placed in the universe. And we can share this with our students. And one of the key ways that we really uh, can do this is by showing our students the beauty of God's creation, the beauty of God's redemption, and the beauty of their own vocation. Pope Benedict XVI said that at this moment in time, he thinks that there are two major uh, defenses of the faith, that is, or two major explanations of the faith, he says, the witness of the saints and the beauty of the church, the beauty of Christian art. Why uh, those two? And I think it's because in a postmodern society, right, people don't want the truth just thrown at them. They see that as hostile. But to learn about the witness of another person, right, the witness of the saints, that's not only the canonized saints, but it's the witness of a holy person to say, wow, look at their life. I see the beauty, I see the truth in their life. Or the beauty of Christian art to say, why is it that the Catholic Church has created the most beautiful art in human history? You have Notre Dame Cathedral, like Michelangelo, those things that we've already um, had up on the screen here. Why did that come out of the Christian vision? Um, and it truly does come back to the incarnation of the Son of God, right? That Jesus has brought eternal truth and eternal beauty into this world and expressed it in his very person. And that this continues on um, to, in this expression in the life of the church. Okay, but I want to take a step back here just to say, well, first of all, what is beauty, right? You know, because it's one of these words that we use a lot. And if you were to say, okay, what's beauty? Can you define it? Um, I don't know if I can, right? Truth, okay, truth has a basic definition. The conformity of the mind to reality. Right? If I know the truth of something, that means that my mind is understanding and grasping that truth outside of myself. What is goodness? Right? Goodness is that which we desire, that which truly fulfills and perfects us on many different levels. Right? The goodness of the food that I eat, my body needs it. Right? But also the goodness of the things that I need in my soul and in my mind. But what about beauty? Right? Is beauty something, something that's simply subjective? Right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so it's basically relative, right? Whatever I think beauty is, well, I can't define that, right? Even St. Thomas Aquinas said that uh, beauty is that which pleases. Well, this pleases me, that pleases you, so how can I really get to a definition of beauty? Well, there are objective elements to it as well. It's our perception, our, our realization of the splendor, the radiance of life. And so Aquinas also said that there were three major characteristics of beauty, a kind of proportion or symmetry, right? That things are balanced. Things that we think are beautiful have this kind of proportion to them. They have a kind of clarity, that is, they speak to us uh, with a kind of radiance or splendor about life. Um, and that they also have a kind of perfection to them, an integrity or perfection. And when we say, that's beautiful, right? That's what we're getting after. Um, that I actually saw this, it's another BBC documentary on beauty, but um, somebody wanted to see if there actually was an objective element to beauty. So they actually had a whole range of images. And, and this person asked, you know, hundreds of people to rank them in order of beauty. And they, he said that he got a 100%, you know, uh, similarity in the responses. There is something objective to beauty, right? And so we're just going to begin looking at some layers of beauty, right? The most basic level of beauty is simply natural beauty. And we say, 
that's a beautiful tree. What do we mean? Well, it really speaks to us just about the beauty of life. As I was saying, it has that clarity to it. Um, a beautiful tree is usually going to be proportionate. And if we say that, that's really beautiful, right? It has a kind of perfection that it's manifesting to us. I mean, contrast it with this, for instance, right? When we say that that's a beautiful tree, no, that's a butchered tree, right? Uh, it doesn't have its integrity and perfection um, any longer, all right? And so we wouldn't say, that, that wouldn't be my top example, right, of a beautiful uh, tree. But if we were going to take this uh, even deeper, right, a lot of the, when we think of beauty, a lot of times we think of art, right? And so this is Van Gogh's depiction of a tree. Is it simply a reproduction of what a tree looks like? No, he's taking us deeper, right? He's helping us to look at a tree from a deeper angle, from his, as Roger Scruton even said in that video, right? It's his kind of vision of life that maybe helps us to see, this, this almost looks like there's movement here. You know, trees don't move a lot, but, but here, this tree is grabbing me, right? It's speaking to me through the color, through, through the movements of these branches, right? He's helping me to look at a tree from a new perspective that I, I wouldn't have seen if I had just kind of just walked in the woods myself. Right? But we can take beauty even deeper when it comes to religious art, right? Where did, uh, human sin begin right, through a tree, right? And so all of a sudden, a tree doesn't simply m mean a tree anymore. It can become a symbol of something else. And here in this Renaissance depiction uh, of the baptism, we can see that the artist, Della Francesca, is using this image of a tree to make us think about our redemption, right? That Jesus, by becoming man, is overturning what happened under the first tree, and he's also showing that when Jesus embraces his, his baptism, the mission that God, that the Father has given him, it's going to lead him to another tree, the tree of the cross, right? And so this simple and beautiful depiction of, of a tree using religious art shows us that trees and nature and the human person can, can be symbols even of the transcendent when it comes to art. So we can teach about transcendent realities and even... We can help it to experience them uh, through the beauty of art. But then we look at modern art, right? We get to abstraction. Where modern art has, it's still using our experience of nature, but it's, when I say abstract, what I mean, it's, it's projecting things onto nature and through art which do not have a direct connection uh, to nature. It's more of the, the artist's um, projection of their own thoughts and emotions. Um, and so there can be beautiful modern art, but I think a lot of times we don't have the kind of transcendent experience that we had when it came to looking at uh, Della Francesca, right? When we look at this, we're like, oh, well, okay. I mean, there's some interesting use of color here. I, I, I'm not quite sure what the artist is after, um, but you know, it, but it's not as inspirational, right? And so we want to talk more about the inspiration of art, you know, why beauty matters. And I think we've already hinted at that with that quote from Pope Benedict, right? That in a time when truth is in question, at a time when goodness is in question, right? Beauty still has the power to inspire us. Beauty can still capture our imagination. Beauty can speak to our heart in a way that you know, a direct presentation of truth or goodness, you know, it, we, someone may be closed off to that. And so, uh, even going back to the example of Notre Dame, I've heard people say that I walked into Notre Dame Basilica and I knew that there was a God. Right? I knew that there was a reality to faith. We are, as human beings, we are body-soul unities. We're not just souls kind of trapped in, in, in a body, right? And so we experience even the transcendent realities through our senses, right? And so art has this way of capturing things that words can't even capture, right? If I just were to say, oh, you know, let me tell you about, you know, this is the example of the rose window in Notre Dame. Let me tell you about the, the prophets in the Old Testament and how they relate to the New Testament. It's like, oh, okay, all right, you know. But here... You, ca you know, the, the artist of this window is able to capture that connection uh, in a way that exceeds words. 
to the point that we could actually speak of beauty as an arrow that wounds us. Right? If we are truly open to beauty, right, it can have this very powerful impact on our hearts. I think the best way of understanding this is falling in love. Right? When, you when you meet someone for the first time, and they impact you in that deep of a way that you fall in love with them, right? It is like an arrow is piercing your heart. Or when you really met God for the first time, right? That falling in love with God, it's like an arrow that pierces you. How many people have been to Notre Dame or Chartres Cathedral, right? When you walk into Notre Dame, right, and you see that rose window for yourself, it is like an arrow that pierces your heart. You say, I can't put it into words. I can't even explain it. But this has touched me so deeply, right? It's changed me. There's a transformation here. I am no longer the same because I experienced this great beauty, whether it's the beauty of, a, of another person, right, when you fall in love with them, or it's the beauty of a great piece of art, or even the beauty of great literature, right? I am not the same. It's pushed me out of my comfort zone. I can't look at life the same way anymore. That's that arrow of beauty that sort of pierces through the protective layer that all of our students come to school with, right? You know, they say, I don't know if I can get through that, but beauty can get through that, right? Capturing the heart, capturing the imagination. And, and of course, when we look at the cross, we see a different kind of beauty. Now, this is a very beautiful um, painting by Perugino, where he's taking something that in itself might be a bit gruesome, Right? When, you really, when you watch you know, Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, right? what Jesus did for us is a gruesome reality. Um, and so what we see is that the most beautiful person ever to exist, the Son of God become man, surrendered his beauty for us, sacrificed the beauty of his life for us. And so this particular painting, I think, captures the beauty of our redemption to say, Look what God did for us. This is beautiful. This pierces my heart through the love of God. But, what, but if, if we look at this from a different perspective, we can also say maybe it doesn't capture the reality of what Jesus did for us. Can we actually look at the way in which beauty itself has become distorted? That beauty itself has suffered a disfigurement for us. And I think this is very important because if we just kind of said, beauty's so amazing, beauty can change your life, you say, oh, that's nice, but I go back to the rest of my life, and it's kind of messy. It doesn't always look, you know, picture perfect. It doesn't look like a Renaissance painting. You know, there's broken relationships in my family. I experience the ugliness of sin. Or I, the ugliness maybe even in my classroom some days, right? No. <laughs> and so... How do I make sense of the ugliness that I experience in my life? And I think we have to say, the beauty of the Word incarnate, right, became disfigured for our sake. Right? He took on our disfigurement. He took on our suffering and redeemed it. Right? We can even say, like, when we look at what's going on in the church right now, if the church, as I mentioned earlier, is the continuing incarnation of the Son of God, then this will also include the crucifixion. That we will experience the grace and the beauty that the Son of God gives us through His incarnation, but we are going to experience His crucifixion as well. And so the beauty of being able to capture this, this is uh, Hans Holbein, as I said on the last slide, right? The beauty of being able to capture this helps us to say, oh my gosh, Jesus experienced even my suffering. And I can see through, you know, in, in this, you know, how he brings beauty and suffering together. Uh, th this painting comes out in Dostoevsky's novel, The Idiot, where the, the, the prince, the idiot, is looking at this painting with, with another one of the main characters. And the prince says, looking at this painting, one could almost lose their faith. Because you see that extreme suffering and even death that the Son of God took on. It should be shocking. 
right? Uh, one of the, the great writers of the grotesque, Flannery O'Connor. How many people have been shocked out of your mind by a Flannery O'Connor short story, right? You know, you're like, uh, why are we reading this? This is crazy, right? Because she said, sometimes you have to shout at your audience to get their attention, right? And I think that's what the prince is saying, like, this painting shakes me to the core when I see it. Or you could look at another example here um, with this uh, Renaissance painting of uh, Grunewald. There's something shocking about this where I have to say, you know what? Human life is full of suffering. Jesus took this on. And so life is not, you know, just smelling the roses, right? But there's, there's good moments of smelling the roses, right? But Jesus helps me to understand the brokenness of my own life and how it's been redeemed and the beauty of the gift. And so why does this matter, right? Because there's a beauty that is deeper than the physical portrayal, right, of art. But art can still manifest that and help us to think, well, is there a sacrificing of my life you know, all of us are going to have to die, right? Our lives are very beautiful, but we're going to have to die. And so we look at this painting and say, is there a beauty even in the suffering that I go through when I learn to give my life as a gift? And so I see the beauty even of the struggle, struggle in the classroom, right? the struggle in my family, even the struggle with my own sinfulness that Jesus took on himself on the cross. And so we want to ask then, as Christians, how do we look at the world? How do we see these different levels of beauty, right? We talked about natural beauty, artistic beauty, supernatural beauty, the difficulty of possibly seeing kind of the beauty in the modern world, even though it's kind of confused, right? And so we want to, as teachers, learn to look at reality on all of those different layers from a deep perspective of contemplation we want to help our students to be able to learn to look to see beauty in all of these different ways right this is a disposition that we have to cultivate in ourselves and in our students in every subject even that we teach right we're not most of us are not art teachers right say well okay that this this talk doesn't apply to me because i'm not an art teacher we, we want to see beauty in mathematics. We want to see beauty in science as we, we look at the wonder of the natural world. We want to see beauty in literature. We want to see beauty in theology. This is all learning to contemplate the meaning which we see in our lives and in the world around us. However, what are we dealing with, right? All of us have a tendency to focus on ourselves. Right? This is the effect of the fall this downward turning of our minds and, and our freedom. Kind of, we're, we're more focused on the immediate that surrounds us uh, than we are upon the deeper realities of life. And so there is this tendency, especially right now, towards narcissism, right? Which is captured very well by Titian, right? This, this beautiful woman who's just fixated on her own self. Not seeing beauty as a gift, right? But focused rather simply on her beauty for her own sake. And this is something we really struggle with, especially with the internet, right? I'm looking out, I'm seeing 10 people right now who are looking at something else, <laughs> at least, right? Uh, and so we are distracted by the delight of the eyes, right? The immediate captures our attention. The superficial captures our attention. The passing pleasure captures our attention, right? Which John, uh, in his letter, describes as the delight of the eyes. And so that can actually be a block from seeing deeper beauty, from being able to contemplate the reality. And beyond that, this is actually uh, an image of a Catholic artist, Andy Warhol. He was a Byzantine Catholic who had many struggles, right? So I'm not saying he's a saint by any means. Right? But he's, he, he's helping us to see this, right? He, he's the, the great pop culture artist. What is he saying? That's where we've come, to the pop culture. When you look at movies, are most movies beautiful? Well, not really. I mean, okay, some cool, you know, special effects, I guess, and, you know, and so what do we see, right? The distraction. What is Warhol telling us in this image, right? He's taking the Last Supper from Da Vinci, kind of bringing it down to the pop culture level, and showing us how we are commercializing life. 
that we are making life into something banal and boring. We're covering over the beauty with the superficial. This is something that we have to struggle against. This is the battle that we face in our classroom. And we want to go back to this Catholic way of looking at the world, this sacramental vision. Now, this is one of my favorite artists, Velazquez, right, from the Spanish Golden Age. And this is a genre painting, just a, a painting of ordinary life, uh, where it's just a, an older woman who's, you know, you can kind of see she's maybe given a younger woman a hard time, like, get to work here, you know? Um, now, he captures the, the, even the beauty of this scene very well, right? When you really get into the details and you see the, the shininess and the fish's eyes, right? So he's helping us to look at reality, the beauty of just an ordinary scene. But he's also doing more, right? When you look at the, what's the name of this painting? It's, it's the, the name is not focused on the two women in the foreground. It's focused on the women in the background, Mary and Martha, right? And so he, he Velasquez is helping us to look at an ordinary scene from an extraordinary point of view, to say, how, how does my faith in Jesus, in which I enter into the Gospels, right? How is that something that actually enters into my life? Like, people actually speculate, is this a window, a mirror, is it a painting? I mean, that's the easiest solution, right? It's maybe a painting. But Velasquez wants us to see the, the daily ordinary scene in light of the Gospel, in light of our faith, and to interpret the present moment from that spiritual perspective. And so Catholics have a sacramental vision of life. As I mentioned, nothing is simply ordinary. Every human being is a sacrament of a spiritual soul manifesting itself in the world, right, through our body, through our life. Everything that God created is a sacrament of himself, of his mind in the world. And every human action is an opportunity for grace or for sin. And this is the way we have to look at life, to kind of capture the beauty even in, as I mentioned, the midst of sin. And so this is something I've wondered, right? Is there a beautiful depiction of sin? This is from Hieronymus Bosch, and if you look him up, you'll be shocked out of your mind, <laughs> because he uh, is a Renaissance painter who depicts all kinds of crazy, misshapen animals and figures and demons, right? If you look up the temptation of St. Anthony, Right, you just don't do it now, right? Don't do it now. No, but <laughs> if you look that up later, right, you'll see all kinds of cr crazy things because he is trying to find ways of depicting spiritual things um, in, through the ordinary kind of sacramental vision of life. And so this is a, a detail of that picture of the seven deadly sins, right, where you have pride, someone becoming blinded by their pride or, or lust, right, this distortion of human life and, and relationships, or they come misshapen even through them. All right, and so I've come to the conclusion that yes, even the, the, the darkness of life can be depicted in a beautiful way. Think about the feast day today, right? A lot of people say, where was God at Auschwitz, right? Is it possible to talk about beauty and faith anymore after Auschwitz when we see the darkness of human life and we say, God was there? Right, look at St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, her religious name. Right? She was there offering her life in love. Right? She brought beauty along with St. Maximilian Kolbe, right? even to Auschwitz. All right, so just our, our last section here to kind of wrap up. How does this then apply more practically to the Catholic school? Right? How can we help our students to form this sacramental um, vision of life and to recognize beauty from this more contemplative uh, point of view. Now, contemplative, I just mean is being very thoughtful about life, thinking about things. And it really does begin with fairy tales. Right? If we don't lay the foundation at the very beginning by awakening our students' imagination, it's going to it's gonna be very hard to keep them engaged for all the higher level things you want to do. Right? We want to teach our students in a very human way and you be, how do we begin? With the senses, the emotions, and the imagination, right? And so our learning has to be very tactile at the younger age, and we have to awaken the imagination of our students to what is true, to what is good, to what is beautiful, through stories, through images, through examples. And as we get even deeper and deeper, 
right? We want to keep the imagination going. Why do we teach literature? Well, even things like Flannery O'Connor or difficult literature when it comes to high school. Because this is how we form the moral imagination. We don't want our students and actually having to go out and to learn everything on their own, make every bad decision on their own and, and find out the consequences. Right? The moral imagination helps us to place ourselves um, vicariously into characters in a story. Now, this is an historical example I gave, right, of Brutus, not the Brutus who killed Caesar, but the Brutus who founded the Roman Republic, right, who executed even his own sons for rebelling against the republic that he founded, right? Now, there's a moral choice for you, right? You can ask your students, what would you do, right? If you established a republic and you took an oath that you would never allow anyone to restore the monarchy and then your own sons tried to do it, what would you do, right? That's just one, one example, right? This is a, a beautiful depiction of a difficult moral choice, but that's what we really want our students to have to think through as we engage them in the beauty of literature. We also want them to think about the beauty of human life. God created us man and woman, and we're going to unpack that, right? And there's a beauty here that even draws us into the life of God as we're made in his image and likeness and called to love as he even loves within his Trinitarian self, right? And so art, literature, the witness that we give in the classroom, this should help us to see that life truly is something beautiful. Life is worthwhile. I am called to this wonderful adventure of life because I think so many times we do lose focus on that and think, well, what really is the purpose, right? Is there a purpose to my life? Is there meaning to my life? We want our students in Catholic schools to really be able to grasp that. We also want them to recognize the beauty of learning, that there really is something to be discovered that they are very active in this. They're not just passive and being spoon-fed everything, right? Education can be that way, but nobody likes to learn that way. Think back to your own experience, right? We're calling them into the beauty of learning. Um, and in a way, you could also define beauty as truth and goodness manifested in a way that awakens wonder in us, that awakens awe in us. And if the truth is really presented in that way, we do want our students awakening to that. We want them to see the beauty of faith. And so mass needs to be experienced in a way that reflects its mystery, that reflects its transcendent reality. The fact that we are really meeting God there. Jesus is truly present with his body and blood. And religious ed is not just about teaching ideas. It really is about encountering beauty himself, beauty incarnate in Christ. Right? We have to keep pointing right, to the beauty of this relationship with Christ um, that we experience in prayer and that we experience at Mass, or, or at least should. And then the beauty of the, the witness of the saints. What does a beautiful life look like? Right? So beyond the witness of Christ himself, beauty himself, right? we have the witness of the saints to say, this is someone who fulfilled the purpose of their life. Why? It goes back to that gift, right? The beauty of the gift, even to the point of death, right? This brings us back to the very beginning, right, the, of the Roman martyrs. We have St. Sebastian here, who had courage to give his life. And El Greco, I mean, portrays even just the longing in his face, the kind of the upward look to say, even as he's being shot full of arrows here, right, you know, he is focused on what is beyond, right? And, and you see that with St. Francis here as well. You know, that deep contemplation that he has of, of death, of eternal life, of the gift of Christ on the cross. And you can feel that, right? That's how, I mean, that's why art is important even in religious ed class, right? As we can feel St. Francis's prayer, we can experience some of it through our senses, through the beauty of El Greco, and, right? And, and even with St. Peter, right? If when you look at this picture closely, you see the tears coming down his face. This is St. Peter repentant. Um, from his betrayal of Christ. So once again, the beauty, even in our experience of sin and the redemption that can be present um, sacramentally to us. Okay, so I want to come back even to abstraction then, right? You know, we live in a very difficult time. We live in a time that is very ugly in many ways. But can we bring beauty within it, even in a way that is suited to our own culture? Uh, this is uh, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Uh, that was uh, designed by Gaudí, who is now actually servant of God, Gaudí, who really found a way to take the church's tradition, 
right? This great legacy that we were talking about in church history and to present it in a way that people can understand and experience right now. And I think that's our task. I think he captures it, right? Can we build new cathedrals right now, right, in our classroom? I'm not talking literally, right? But can we present this beauty in a way that our students can understand and experience and, and that really meets them where they are at, right? We are not in the Middle Ages anymore, but we have inherited that great legacy and we want to bring it to our students um, and help them to experience it um, and to begin to live it. Thank you.